Hi everybody, my name is The Reading Tortie and welcome back to my channel. Today we'll be doing the book review for The Last Kingdom by Bernard Cornwell. Part of a series, which I don't usually do. And of course, because it's a series, it couldn't just be like three books or even four books. It's ten books long, but I'm going to stick it with it because... I fell in love with the characters, the cast, the setting, the place, the writing, the book itself, everything. I did it in audiobook, though, and I still fell in love with it. And I had to go buy the book and leafing through it. It smells beautiful, looks beautiful, feels gorgeous. This book is amazing. In case you haven't noticed, it's also consuming my life. So, on to the book review. My notes, because i got a lot of stuff to say about this, um, and details about the book. The title is The Last Kingdom by Bernard Cornwell, historical fiction, and it was published by HarperCollins in 2004 in the UK. It is part of the Saxon Stories series, which is a bit of an understatement in my part, in my opinion, since it's 10 books. And, spoiler, Uhtred doesn't die, because in 10, book 10, he's like about to besiege Bebenberg. Don't know if he dies in book 10, but he doesn't die in books 1 through 9. So, the book, The Last Kingdom, is... Okay. So, it's set between 866 and 876, when Atreid is 10 years old to 20 years old. So, you get chunks of his life per books. Um, Atreid, at the beginning of the story, you f find out that he's actually born into a Saxon family, but... He is then kidnapped under war circumstances by the Danes, and he is raised as the initial slave and then later adopted son to one of the earls of the Danes named Earl Ragnar. Earl Ragnar, y'all. Seriously. And the book pretty much follows him through his childhood, knowing who's a friend, who's an enemy, who holds prejudices against him for being a Saxon? Because Ragnar doesn't. Earl Ragnar is like, you are my son, my servant. We're good. We're solid. But not all the Danes see it that way. So it's him growing up in that environment. His philosophies from being a Saxon Christian kind of just going out the window as he adopts the new uh, pagan gods, which is Norse mythology, you know, Odin and Thor. And... As he flip-flops back and forth between the Danes and the Saxons and trying to cope with fighting friends on one side, fighting enemies on the other, and who is he really? Because the morals that he has are shaped by the Danish way of life, and it doesn't fit into King Alfred's Christian Wessex civilization, the Saxon ways. So when he ends up going and pledging his service to King Alfred, he really starts to realize that he might not be a Dane and he might not be a Saxon, but in his heart, as a child, from the very beginning, he knows, I am from Bebenberg and I'm going to return to my home. I'm going to take it back from my uncle who usurps it you know, hint, hint, you figure that out pretty early, uncle's a bad dude. And he is motivated through his confusion, through his development, through all of the conflicting values from all the different cultures and societies that he's raised in, all the people he comes into contact with, that his home, no matter where he is, is Bebenberg. And he is going to go back home to his roots and he's never going to forget it, no matter who he's with. Even if it is with Earl Ragnar, he asks him, can I go back to my home? And Earl Ragnar says, when I'm done, I will help you go back to your home. And it's just beautiful stuff. The camaraderie makes me weep. So, general synopsis. There's a bunch of war, a bunch of killing. Atreid's like, I'm going to be the best warrior ever. And that's what he sets out to do when he is a young child. And he gets the crap beat out of him many times by many people. And he gets into a lot of trouble sometimes. But he doesn't quit. And he's resilient. And he's very goal-oriented, and I'm going to live my way or the highway. And sometimes it's the highway. So it's, it's just he's an awesome character. Even though he's a brute, a warrior, he's motivated by very basic principles of 
trying to find where he belongs and going back to where he thinks he belongs, which at the root of it all, I think all of us kind of can relate to that. So the characters are expansive. There's certain characters that cross books. Some that don't. Some that don't. It's sad. But the characters in this book are mainly Atrid. Atrid. Bayoka, who is... Ah, uh, Bayoka. He's, he's kind of like the Jiminy Cricket of the book. And he's trying to steer Atrid in the right way. And he's like, I was with you when you were born. And Atrid's like, so... So Bayoka is just trying to be there for him, and he's one of the few people that isn't necessarily afraid of Atrid, but he knows that Atrid has a temper and catch him at the right time in the wrong way, and you'll probably get knifed or hacked or both. So Bayoka, King Alfred, who is complicated, very intelligent, strategist, but... He is crippled by his devotion, uh, fanatical devotion to God and the Christian church. And so his judgment is clouded by it, just like some of the Danes are clouded by superstition. So neither is good on extremities. There's Leia Frick. Leia Frick and Atrid have possibly one of the most hilarious, organic, beautiful relationships ever. Ever. It can be a bromance, it can be a friendship, whatever you, whatever you want to call it. A trade in Leofric. Leofric's like the, the grouchy older brother or even the older cool uncle that's like, why are you being an idiot? I could be a dumbass. And he, you know, Leofric regularly beats the crap out of Utrid and insults him. But that's the way it is. And when Utrid is, you know, down in the dumps, he can't get worse. Leofric's there to be like, oh man, told you so. Just kicking dirt in his face and laughing at him, and Etrid's like, I, I want to kill you right now. And Leia Frick's just still laughing his ass off. And that's a relationship, and I love it because it's just so, so true. Because they bonded as brothers in arms, they bonded out on the seas when everyone was dying, they bonded when everybody else was, was you know, turning away, and they're like, We stand here together, and they just have this absolute trust in each other that really shows and i love it and it's beautiful it's beautiful stuff everyone so and then there's ragnar earl ragnar who is a beautiful beautiful character he is a dane but he is such a human dane he's he's not as bloodthirsty as the other ones you got ogba who's like i'm gonna drink your blood and i'm gonna love every second of it and you know, I'm going to decapitate you and hang your head on my wall and I'm going to love it and I'm going to look at you and insult you every day. Very crazy. But Ogba is, like, terrifying. He's actually a historical figure. But then Earl, but Earl Ragnar is much softer, not as superstitious as Ogba, and he has a better head on his shoulders. Sense of, he has a sense of reason and he sees value and when he sees someone that he knows has great potential as a warrior especially, he doesn't care if you're a Saxon or you're a Dane. He's going to take you. He's going to try to make you into the best warrior you can. And because of his personality, you're going to be won over. You're going to forget that this is one of the most feared men in, in the land. And you're just going to fall in love with the guy that's like drinking and having dinner with you. And it's just, it's great stuff. And Brita. I watched the series. And Brita in the series, I didn't quite like her. I thought she she was a little childish sometimes and just like pouty and temper tantrums. But in the book, she's very wise and, you know, strategic. And she is said to have some sort of like witch powers that help her. And that's why she's so wise and she has foresight. So Brita in the book is really, really cool. I actually really like her. So those are the characters. In case you haven't noticed, they're awesome, well-rounded. They have their flaws. They have their errors. They have just everything going on for them. And I, I love them so much. A trid, plus everybody else. A trid and everyone else, guys. Seriously. It's good stuff. So the setting. The setting is in the 9th century, like, England. It's back 
in the day when Wessex and stuff was still around. And the setting is alive with historicism, with the religion and the cultures of the Danes and the Saxons alike. And it's just very real in that it doesn't matter what side you're on, you can lose, you can die, and there are people that die, and it breaks my heart, and I cried every time. And I would go into work or come home, and I would just sit there and cry and mourn what happened, because these characters just are so real. They become a part of who you are, and it's so real. So it's, it's a very a real feeling that in 9th century A.D., the, the world didn't care about you. The weather didn't care. Didn't matter what gods you were praying to. If the sea decided to screw you over and you were going to end up, you know, sleeping with the fishes, you're going to end up sleeping with the fishes no matter what sacrifices you make. So the setting is very real and it's beautiful. It The hills, as you run on your horse towards battle, you're there and you feel it and you smell the earth. And when there's water and you're in a swamp, you can smell it and you feel the humidity and the ickiness. And everything is just so vibrant and alive with colors it's just leaping off the pages at you so the setting is so beautifully painted and in the cities the cities are disgusting you see that it's rampant with disease and filth and dirty and bernard cornwall does not try to make it look pretty this is what it is it was not pretty looking and when you're in it you can feel the filth and the stench on you from from everybody like sloshing around in the streets and all the the sewage and all that stuff so it's it's just amazing so setting is great um, you're in the thick of it all through the book. There's not a moment that you kind of like, oh, wait, wait, you know, it's not real. It's like, no, it is real, and you're in it. And when your comrade next to you dies, you feel it, their blood's on you, and you're just like, I'm so sorry, and I want to mourn you, but I got battles to, to win. So it's very real. It's alive. And it doesn't care if you're on the good side or the bad side. We are all equal. And we all get screwed over the same. So the plot really follows um, the Danes trying to take over England, Mercia, Wessex, and Alfred trying desperately to hold on to Wessex because he refuses to be a king in exile. He refuses to give in to the Danes because he believes that the Christian God is on his side and that God is going to prevail. He believes this with as much fervor as he believes that once he steps outside into the snow, he's going to be cold. And it's as real to him then as it is, you know, it's as real to him as that snow, God is present in everything. So the plot is Uhtred and Alfred kind of just always going at it with their differing views and, you know, Uhtred being passive aggressive and, you know, trying to annoy Alfred for just something that he slighted him, but he's the king. And he's such a wise and patient king, too, even though I sometimes hate him. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? But, you know, a trade is very passive aggressive and it's like sliding him. And Alfred's like, OK, whatever. I'm not going to pay attention to you. I choose my battles. I know you're useful to me. Therefore, I'm going to put up with your childishness. And a trade is just like pouty and, uh, and arrogant and young and stubborn. But they have a very beautiful dynamic that is as beautiful as the dynamic with him and Leofric, just differently. Atreid's relationships are all different, and they are all very true and real, and even though Atreid sometimes wants to kill him, he feels there's a kinship at one point, and even though it's sometimes superficial and fleeting, it's very, it's what keeps this entire story together, because it's Atreid being like, I'm going to keep my honor as a man and as a warrior by keeping my pledge to you and Alfred sees that and while sometimes he slights Uhtred he realizes how useful he is to him so the plot really revolves around a lot of war a lot of history a lot of fighting and through it all you see Uhtred developing as a character and you see him deal with facing off against people that he loves facing off against people that he's like I've been wanting to kill you since day one so I'm gonna thank god I've only had a chance to kill you um and the conflict is very multifaceted. You got the big picture, Wessex v. Danes. Danes v. everybody else, because the Danes just go and screw you over if you're not a Dane. And you got Uhtred versus Alfred versus Bayoka. 
and every other person that he decided to piss off, and every person that has ever slighted him. So when he's not off fighting Wessex or fighting the Danes or whoever he, whatever side he's on, he is dealing with his own inner conflict. Who am I? Where do I belong? Is this the right move? Should I just desert and go back to Ragnar and go back to where I come from? Um, and it's him just trying to deal with the new environment, the new culture that doesn't accept him, that doesn't accept his ways. Alfred being stubborn, Utra being stubborn. And so sometimes it's self-made, but the conflict is always there and it keeps the pace going very well. So I love it. There's conflict everywhere and it's beautiful conflict that I just revel in. And the resolution. The resolution, everybody, of the book. When I, when I listened to it, I sat in my car and I was there and I was at the edge of my seat gripping my steering wheel way too hard. And when it all happened, I almost like swerved off the highway. I was trying not to die, trying to make it to work, trying not to cry because it was just so beautiful, so lovely. And Uhtred was probably at his peak of humanity, despite the fact that he was in battle. And Uhtred was just a human and it was so beautiful. And try not to cry because I sat there and I cried. And then I went into work and I sat in my coworker's office and I sat there and I cried some more. She was just like, it's a book, really. It's, it's not that big of a deal, you know? Really, just calm down. And I'm just there like, it's not just a book, and they're real to me, and they were they are real. They're real people to me. So the resolution, in case you haven't noticed, is absolutely beautiful. And it sometimes breaks your heart. Sometimes it doesn't. But, ah, good book, in case you haven't noticed. It's possessed me. Um, As you can tell, my heart... Everything in this book just weighs heavy on my heart, and I feel everything. I got out of my car, and I felt like I was carrying just the entire universe in this book on my shoulders because they were my friends, and my friends were dying, and they were Uttered was in a was in a pickle because of crap that he did to himself. But it's like, why can't I just tell you to quit being an idiot? But he's an idiot, and Leia Frick is there, and I'm just like, Leia Frick, you need to beat the crap out of him some more. But he didn't. And this book is just, it consumed me in a way different from Call Me By Your Name, but it still consumed me. And I, I don't think I've ever made more facial expressions in my car than I did while I was listening to this. And I was crying almost every time I got into my car and I got out and my world was in shambles because the world in here was in shambles. And <sighs> the book is beautiful, amazing. War, there's a lot of war and a lot of graphic killing. But it's all shapes with the characters. It, it all it shapes all the characters, and it's accurate to history somewhat. There's a couple things that are different, but he shifts the timeline around. But it's nothing crazy. And um, okay, it's a beautiful book. I love it. Highly recommend it. People say that Bernard Cornwell has like a formula, and that all of his characters are like warriors, bloodlusters. I'm gonna win battles, and I'm like. It's historical fiction. Back then, that was kind of a big deal. Uhtred has to get to Bevenberg. And the way to do that is to win a reputation and earn renown and respect as a warrior to lead men that trust him and follow him to Bevenberg to go back to where he belongs and where he has decided his home is. So it's beautiful stuff. And I love it. So, The Last Kingdom by Bernard Cornwall. Beautiful book. You guys should Pick it up. Beautiful different from Calling By Your Name, but it's still beautiful and still lovely. So, if you guys are debating picking up The Last Kingdom, Be Warned is a 10-part book series that will probably consume you if you like historical fiction. I love historical fiction, so this is just beautifulness. And, yeah. So, I recommend it. I hope you guys like it. Let me know what you guys think about the book. If you disagree, that's totally fine. I will still sit here and cry and weep and have a stroke over these characters. So, Thank you guys for stopping by. I'm sorry if I looked like I was having a meltdown. This is me toned down. You should have seen me in my coworker's office. Like, poor lady. She deserves a bonus for it. But thanks for stopping by, and take care, and be safe. Bye.